Hello, I'm Kenneth L. Johnson, president of East Coast Executives, the Harlem, New York-based diversity recruitment firm. Welcome to the future of work, diversity, recruitment, and opportunity in a post-pandemic landscape, part of the Urban League Fights for You virtual series. Today, our virtual diversity career fair is all about you and navigating through our new and more complex job market. Are there jobs after coronavirus? The U.S. labor market won't bounce rate right back, so how do you tread with success? The U.S. labor market was in its best shape in nearly 50 years. Then the coronavirus pandemic swept across the country, taking millions of American jobs with it. It will take the labor market time to recover, but it's unclear exactly how long. We're here today to share tips and ways to help you land on your feet. And it's not just the pandemic. The national reckoning on systemic racism taking place in the wake of George Floyd's murder has pressured employers to reevaluate diversity policies concerning recruitment and advancement. Both forces are forging an unpredictable transformative future. Today we have experts to assist us in navigating the new landscape. Working your job search, retaining your job, and simply how to survive 2020 and beyond. To share insights with us are three experts. Valicia Butterfield Jones, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Recording Academy, responsible for advancing the Recording Academy's mission and ensuring that diversity and inclusion are core to business values and standards and demonstrated throughout the entire organization. In 2007, she co-founded Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network, WEEN, a nonprofit global coalition of women and men committed to the balanced positive portrayal of women in the entertainment industry. She is a woman that knows the ins and outs of finding the right job. We also have Deanne Green, currently serves as Vice President, Diversity and Inclusion Strategy and Operations. She leads Associate, Client, and Talent Market Activation Strategy. She extends DNI throughout leadership on ADP products, clients, and partners. Deanne is currently helping design and operationalize a five-year vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion globally. And finally, Lauren Wesley Wilson. Lauren created ColorCom as a luncheon series to gather women of color in communications and media. She was working at a WPP strategic communications firm in Washington, DC, and did not see one person of color in leadership. In 2015, Lauren left her full-time position at a crisis communications firm to grow ColorCom into a multi-million dollar company. She knows that if there isn't a position, you should create one. Wow, an incredible panel, and I'm happy to be here to moderate it, and I want to jump right in. So I have a question for all three of you. Thank you so very much for joining us today, but here we go. So with unemployment rising each day, this is the second largest unemployment amount of unemployment claims in history since the Department of Labor started tracking the data. How do you protect your job? And if you lose your job, what can you do? So let's start out. Let's just start at the top. Lauren. How do people protect their jobs and what should they do in this economy? Well, I would say um, to be able to protect your job, you need to know what's expected of, what does your manager expect for you to do to excel? Because oftentimes we have our own perception, but we don't ask questions. So what does excellence look like for leadership and for that company? And are we headed in that right direction? I think that's so key. Um, I would also say, um, Listen, we're all so lucky if you still have your job to, to keep it, uh, but it, it's not time for guessing. You need to be proactive. You need to take control. You need to regularly check in with your manager and um, always keep kind of your options open. We know the climate that we're in, so we need to be smart about our trajectory. It's not about 100% loyalty to our job because our jobs could cut us at any time, even if we're great, even if we're performing. If we don't add value, we could be gone. So learning what that value is to your role, to your company, but even if you do the, all the right things, so to speak, you still might not be safe. So constantly keep your network intact, constantly be checking in, and constantly see what opportunities are out there. Wow, that's great advice. I really do believe that we all are really a business of one, and I think that's core to the message you just shared. Uh, Deanne, I'd like you to come in and, and help us out here. What do we do? Uh, how do you protect your job? What if you lose your job? What, what's out there for us? 
Yeah. So, you know, look, companies have had to pivot themselves. We need to remember that, that we're pivoting, they're pivoting also. They've had to reprioritize their work um, to find new and different ways um, to deliver, whether that's delivering service to a client base, um, whether that's delivering best practices. Um, They've had they've had to swerve, right? And so we have to swerve too. So I think I think a couple of things I would say we should look for a good balance between knowledge and interpersonal attributes. I think that interpersonal attributes are becoming more and more important. So what do I mean by that? Those soft skills, the emotional, the social, the cognitive abilities, all those traits in a virtual environment just become in greater demand. Um, continue to be visible. If you're not visible, get visible. And I know it's hard, especially for those of us who are introverted, um, but we have to stretch ourselves outside of our com comfort zones right now. And to Lauren's point, connect with people um, who know about you, they know your expertise, but even more importantly, they know what value you will bring in the future. So they understand your runway um, and they're able to help you network and connect with others, whether that's inside your industry or outside of your industry. So those would be three things that I would, I would mention. Exceptional. Uh, Ms. Butterfield Jones, would you like to chime in on this one? I would, and Kenneth, first, I just wanna thank you for having this conversation in the National Urban League. It is an honor to be here. Um, I think we will be defined during this time in two ways, whether we survived and whether we thrived. Full stop. And I really believe that it is critical uh, if we want to thrive during this time to have a contingency plan. And so whether you feel secure in your job or not, I think, you know, we just don't know what tomorrow brings. And so for me, that's contingency planning. I say this at risk for, you know, the employers who are watching, but apply for the job. Right. Even if you feel secure right now, I think it is healthy for all of us to consider and know all of our options just in case. And then also having multiple revenue streams. You can be an entrepreneur. You can work within an organization and build your own thing while doing that. So many of us are, I've done it. And I really, really advise, you know, if you have an entrepreneurial spirit or not, consider what ownership could look like for you in your life, even if you are employed by someone and start exploring those options. You know, let, let's stay right there for a second. So in this job market, the entertainment and hospitality industries are one of the worst hit. What do you say to those people in, the, in those career paths that are nearly non-existent during the pandemic? How do they pivot? Is that for me, Kenneth? Yes, that is definitely for you. Yeah, I wanted to stay with you for a sec. Innovate, take Innovate. advantage of this virtual time that we're in. I never would have thought that I could engage in a panel like this from my home with my shoes off. Right. I think, you know, who would have ever imagined, right, that we can be visionaries during this time, innovate and take advantage of the tools and the technology that we have in our homes and our in, in, at our fingertips. And so I believe that especially for creators whose live shows have been canceled, who can't go on tour, we've seen success with people like D Nice on Instagram Live and others who have really innovated versus the other night, six million impressions with Monica versus Brandy, right? So what a time for us to reimagine. And that's not just for creators, that's for executives, that's for leaders, that's for individuals, everyone watching. Innovate and think differently and reimagine your current work practice. You know, Deanne, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about innovation now. It's my understanding you just received a promotion. Uh, so congratulations, that's remarkable in this environment. It shows a lot about the work that you do and the value that you bring to your organization. But what do you say to people who are looking to advance in their careers? Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, you know, my new role as VP of Diversity and Inclusion for Strategy and Operations for ADP couldn't be more timely. And it really came about because of the crisis situation that, that we are all involved in right now, racial inequality and the things that we're seeing on TV. Um, it created an opportunity and it created an opportunity for our leaders at ADP to have a bigger investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also to drive change. I think the first thing we need to remember is that companies are rethinking talent. They're looking for those opportunities. The future of work is shifting. And so it's a great time to reposition ourselves. I talked about the soft skills and reframing 
um, your talent in a virtual world. But if you have bandwidth to raise your hand for a stretch assignment, I say go ahead and do it. Increase your visibility. Obviously, I do every single call on video. Whether I've combed my hair and put on some makeup that day, I do it on video for the simple reason that we are not physically in the same space anymore. And so seeing who I'm talking to and having the ability to make that eye contact is really, really important. It helps to build and grow the relationships that I have. And then the last thing I would say, which really helped me is really being purposeful and speaking with intent about the type of work that I want to do, um, where my interests lie, where my passions are. People will help you get there, but they need to know your specifics. Otherwise, they're going to throw things at you that they think you want. They know that you're good at doing, but that might not, not necessarily be fulfilling for you. And I've been in that seat. But the moment I started to be purposeful and I started to think with intent about what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be, an opportunity presented itself and it really presented itself at a time that's so important, um, time for us to do some important work. So um, that's how it happened for me. I, I say, you know, don't look at the crisis as um, debilitating. The crisis has huge opportunity behind it. You know, speaking of opportunity, I want to bring Lauren into the conversation. Lauren, usually when I hear the word opportunity and we just talk, start talking about uh, even Black women in general coming into the world of entrepreneurship, is that the way to go? Is this the time to find a need and then fulfill it as an entrepreneur? If you have one, yes. Um, I don't think you should just go out there blindly Get your affairs in order before you decide to be an entrepreneur. If you're still working at your company, you still have a full-time job and you think that, look, my full-time job may not be safe. I might have more job security if you were in control and if you were an entrepreneur. Get your affairs in order. And what I mean by that is go on LegalZoom, become an incorporated business or an LLC, decide which one you're going to go. Is it going to be an S corporation? Is it going to be a C corp? Is it going to be an LLC and why? Is it going to be a nonprofit and why? So make those decisions. Then decide, is this business that I'm thinking about going into or starting, is it driving revenue already? What are my plans to drive revenue that allows me to make the same as what I'm currently making, be employed by somebody else? So think about that. Make a plan for yourself in terms of what does one year look like in your business? What does three years look like? What does five years look like? We understand you might deviate from the plan. We understand that risks happen, things out of your control happen. But if you have a plan, you know a direction to follow. If you don't have a plan, you're just out here grasping for straws and you don't, you're wasting time and you don't necessarily know who to connect with who can help fuel your business model. So if you have a direction, and you kind of have a plan, head in that direction. You don't want to just be a pack of Skittles where you just undo the pack and they're different colors and they're sliding all over the place. You want to be, you know, a, a Snickers bar, so to speak. You want to be a concrete candy bar where you're saying, okay, I know what I'm going to get. And so therefore you can articulate what is my business model? What is my revenue plan? How do I plan really to make money? That's what your partners and people who invest in you are going to ask. Investors are going to want to know how they're going to make their money back. Your parents are going to want to know if they're putting money into your business, how they're going to make their money back. You want to know if you're giving up your time, if you're quitting your job, how you're going to make ends meet. So you need to kind of have a plan. You need to figure out, are you fulfilling a void? Are you solving a solution to the problem? Is it going to just be you? Is it going to be a partner? And if it's just you, who along the way strategic partnerships are going to help you get to where your goals are. But you got to start with goals. You got to start with outlining it. I think business plans are key. You don't necessarily need a business degree, but you need to have something down on paper that allows you to say, I'm working towards something. I love it. Entrepreneurship mapping. I also love that you referenced the M&M Mars products. My father spent 30 years with them, so I know about the Skittles and the Snickers. Yeah, oh. part, of my, part of my career planning right there. I love it. And right I just, you know, I always use analogies because it's so helpful for us to all visualize, right? I'm a visual person, so I can, I can talk in visuals, and I think, you know, entrepreneurship sounds so sexy, right? You know, you have Instagram, you have people, you have leaders who might look up to you, think they're living these glamorous lives or they're having these lifestyles that you want to emulate 
and it's because they have control over their career and they're solving a need. But entrepreneurship comes with a lot of lonely nights, a lot of scary nights, no matter if you're doing well or not doing well, you're still in a constant churn of, I have to make payroll for myself or for other people. And how is that going to happen? Brass tacks. And nobody cares what your Instagram followers are. Nobody cares how fancy a lifestyle you want to live. It really just comes down to dollar and cents. And you may not be great at math, but you got to get great at math really fast to learn. Am I making and am I entering into a viable business? And that's what separates somebody who has a business for the long term or someone who just has something that's trendy, lasting for a few months and gone. And so for me, you know, Colorcom, we've been in business for nine years. Five, four of those years, no, five of those years, I run the business full time. So I stepped away from my full time job while I was running Colorcom, changed it to a different model and ran it full time. Um, so those are some long term things you have to think about because it's not a sexy endeavor. endeavor. It's really about fulfilling a void and making sure whatever you're fulfilling is profitable and making sure you have the skills to allocate where the money goes because it doesn't all go to your pocket you know it goes to health insurance 401k it goes to investing into the business it goes into things that you can't predict or see in the future and you have to be alert clear savvy and understand your marketplace you know uh i'm hearing a lot of intersectionality in the process right so you know people can still work and be on the path to entrepreneurship you know the gig economy is really big right so just overall and, and i want to i'm sorry that's the safest path that's the same you already have a job. your side hustle maybe is becoming more than a side hustle yes. maybe it starts in revenue maybe you're thinking okay I could actually make my salary or close to it if I leave. So that's a safe path if you have that opportunity. You know, and so that, so that's the one way. But there are some people out here that actually are entrepreneurs and their business is slowed down and they're looking to kind of come back in maybe and work for somebody. So, uh, and this is out to all the panelists. What are the, what are the tips for finding work during the COVID-19 pandemic? Can I start? Yeah, please jump in. Let's go. I think sometimes like situations and fear hold us back. So pretend you're like not in a pandemic because I think we get these mixed messages where nobody, people say, people tell people this, right? You get this message of nobody's hiring. You can't find work. You know, you're, there's the most unemployment, da, 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 da. I would say apply, apply, apply and step it up. You know, because you're in the, in the situation that you're in, don't let fear hold you back, just times whatever you would do by two. And really, when you look at it, did you really apply or connect with, let's say, 50 jobs or 50 prospects per day, or were your numbers pretty low? Like, step it up, have volume, and that's where you're going to see results, I would say, during this time. Definitely. Because people are hiring. People are hiring. Yes. Yeah. And my, wait, one more thing, add what might be expensive for a company, your salary might be cheap for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just like a Russian roulette, but you where you might have been, been expensive for your company, they might have not have saw value and you, you go to another company and they might say, you know what, we're getting you for a really good deal. You know, you know, Deanne, you're, you're sitting right in the middle of this, right? So how do, how do people get on the radar of the talent acquisition team there with your organization. Uh, what are your tips for people to find work during COVID-19? You know what, <laughs> Kenneth? Network, network, network. Um, I think in this, this type of economy, you've got to lean in to the people who know you and who can speak for you um, and, and take some risks. Y you know, there, there are 10 requirements of the job. Um, you fit six or seven. I say go for it. Go for it. Do you have to check all 10 boxes? No. Um, what job do we ever see on paper? Which job description is exactly as it is when you step into the seat? Absolutely none. So, so take some risks. Put yourself out there. Um, stretch a little bit. Learn new skills. Um, there's this viral trend going on on LinkedIn that I absolutely love. I don't know if anyone's seen it. But a lot of people are offering to help. They're saying things like, 
if you've been recently laid off or if you've lost your job and you're looking for work, please contact me. Do it. Take them up on it. Um, stretch your network. I, I personally have been excited to see what has come out of some of, some of that campaign. Um, I, say, I say go for it. And don't doubt yourself. You don't have to have every single match for a role that you're interested in, right? You can, you, you will learn the pieces that are missing. Um, and so, you know, give yourself, give yourself a little bit of stretch opportunity there. If you see something that you like, go out and go after it. You spoke about LinkedIn. I want to know, uh, are you seeing anything there that's kind of indicating what jobs are in demand during COVID-19? Anyone can chime in on this, but I'm just, when, when you spoke about LinkedIn, and I know people go to that platform uh, looking for job opportunities. We just had two members from LinkedIn on the Urban League Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series show that I host yesterday. We had over five, we had a thousand people register uh, for that actual event because people are so interested in learning about LinkedIn. But I think more importantly, they're interested in learning about what jobs are out here. Uh, are you guys seeing any trends in regards to what jobs are currently available? Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that one. So ADP publishes the National excuse me, Employment Report. Um, it actually came out for August just yesterday. And the August report, you know, was mildly positive. It's showing some slow recovery and, and job, you know, job gains are minimal. Um, businesses are certainly not back to their pre-COVID employment levels, but we're starting to see a little bit of gain. So um, 480,000 non-farm private sector jobs in August. That's, that's, that's good. Um, and of that, about 389,000 were the service providing sector. So think healthcare and education, really hot right now. Um, leisure and hospitality is picking back up. And then the professional and business services continue, continue to see some, some growth. I think you know, in, in the beginning, we also saw IT. Um, so anything to do with technology, you have thousands of people, millions of people um, working from home and stressing, you know, broadband, stressing all, all of the, the, the technology that's out there. So we've seen some of that. Um, I haven't seen LinkedIn trends per se, and I may not be looking in the right place, but I'll tell you, looking at the National Employment Report, the, the three areas that seem to be picking back up are healthcare and education, leisure and hospitality, and professional and business services. Wow, that's a lot of information. Great, thank you so very much for sharing. You know, um, <laughs> in this space of COVID-19, uh, the standard pretty much has become Zoom interactions, Zoom interviews, Zoom meetings, things of that nature. Um, do any of you have tips on how job seekers should navigate Zoom interviews? I could start, um, and this ties into the last question too. I really, from my experience, don't think during this time it's a volume game if you are seeking a job. And I really think it's an intention game. And so I, I say that because I remember, you know, when I was out of work um, after working on the Obama campaign, which is just naturally the cycle and flow of you know, working for a political campaign, uh, but out of work, right? And I had this period of like head spinning, wondering what to do next, and then just applying mass, massively, you know, just across every industry, across so many opportunities, because I was just kind of in, you know, fight or flight mode. And, you know, it wasn't until I got really focused with intention and said, you know what, let me focus on one sector at the time it was tech, and let me apply for five positions. And I did that with across three companies, five positions, and ended up receiving offers for four of the five. And I think to your question, Kenneth, a part of that is applying for the roles, doing it with intention. The second is to Deanne's point, sliding up in the DMs, sliding up in the message box on LinkedIn and taking the next step with the recruiter, right? They are accessible to you. And so all the time, you know, in addition to following the formal process, I've been sliding Deanne, Deanne's DM is an example, <laughs> and introduce myself and try to make that connection. But then the third step, which I think is probably the most critical step, which is where I found a lot of success is apply for the jobs that may seem like you are overqualified for. 
not just underqualified for, but overqualified for. So if you can get your foot in the door during an interview, get to the point of an offer and then negotiate. And so there have been so many times that I've interviewed for roles, you know, gone through the process for things that people would have said, oh, you're way overqualified for that. Why would you apply for this role? But I knew, right, if I could just get in the room with the hiring manager and get to the point of an offer, I can actually negotiate a different outcome and it has worked. And so I encourage you to not think like with a wide lens about what, you know, what those opportunities are once you work with intention into where it is that you want to go. Makes a lot of sense. Actually. I'm just piggyback though. I mean, I, I think Alicia and I kind of disagree a little bit. And I think that's the, I think intention should always be like the core of when applying. But I think it's a little different and let's pretend that you don't have a network, you're not connected and you, you, I've been out of work before and I've not been Lauren Wilson who ran ColorCom. I've been out of work and, um, you know, went to Georgetown for grad school. I've been let go and for, to find another job in the middle of the recession was what, what worked for me was volume. You know, I didn't have relationships and connections and things like that. And I think it was really putting as many resumes out there as possible, but then connecting a, the dots along the way. Because submitting your resume alone is not going to be the answer to getting the job. You need to submit the resume, but then you need to find the person who maybe works at that job and really work to build a connection on the inside so that they can really serve as a reference for you. But I see so many young people out of work, and I say young people who are like 10 years younger and in their 20s out of work, and they're not doing the due diligence to really cast a wide net. And if you're not connected and you don't have a lot of resources, casting a wide net is going to be important along with your follow-up to connect the dots to see who is at that company internally who can maybe put a word, slide something through. Because at this point, you can't just say, you know, I've been out of work and I want to get a job and you're only applying to two jobs a day. That's not going to happen for you unless you're someone with a network and resources who can escalate that situation. You know, I think you guys are both saying somewhat the same thing. Having a strategy is, is really important to your approach, right? So you have a strategy for job search and you start quantifying how you do it and have an accomplishment-based statements at the ready to prove that you're someone worthy of the conversation. And I think when people consistently do that, whether it's a wide net or a very structured approach, they start to see results because they're doing the due diligence like you spoke about, they're doing the work. Um, anybody else have any tips for people as they start to interview and have like, all right, so you're doing the work and now you have interviews set up and the, your interviews are going to be on the Zoom platform right now. Any tips on how people should approach that? Yeah, so Kenneth, I would say, I mean, do the normal prep that you would. Lean in on all the steps that you normally would, the researching of the role, the company, the culture, how to dress for the interview at, at that particular company. Um, you know, do the test runs. Do the trial test run for sure. Pick the space. Um, where you're comfortable um, and, you know, where you have some amount of privacy and just note your environment and the background. Definitely get on video. We're not person to person. So um, the eye contact is definitely needed. And then the last thing I would say is, um, you know, since we're not seeing each other and we're not there to read body language, you need to be able to amplify your personality. So be yourself, but be a little bit more of yourself so it comes through on the Zoom interview. I'm not saying that you need to, um, you know, be disingenuous or, or, you know, not be authentic, but you have to find ways to amplify yourself and amplify your personality through the Zoom video so that you're interesting um, and you're adding more, you know, you're coming with talent and you're adding more um, to, to the current team or to the current organization. So um, they have to be able to like you through the video. And we should not forget that. <laughs> Extremely important. You know, just speaking about through the video, right? So as we navigate this new normal, you know, and we're working from home and there's a ton of distractions. Some of us have children uh, that may be at home. Some of us have adult parents that we're taking care of. 
Some of us simply just don't have an office set up. How do we make sure that we present our be best selves in that moment when we have a meeting online through Zoom and we need to, we want to position ourselves as someone worthy of consideration for promotions and things of that nature in the, uh, in the workspace that we're in? Well, I think for me as a mom of two, I have a two-year-old and an eight-year-old, so my two-year-old crashes my Zooms every day. I think it's setting a new norm, even in the interview. And so, you know, what I've done in conversations with new people that, you know, I need to have, you know, a, a very professional conversation over Zoom with, right at the beginning, I named the thing, the elephant in the room. Okay. Like, hey, just letting you know, you know, as we have this conversation, you may see, you know, an appearance. And I kind of make, a, make, make it a light thing, but it establishes, right, a new norm in that conversation and an expectation. And so if you're going into an interview with a potential, you know, employer, and you start off the Zoom, you know, introducing yourself, I always treat those conversations like, you know, talking to a friend, but with data, with receipts, with facts, but then also kind of just, you know, in that opening, saying, hey, you know, I'm a mom, you know, we're, you know, in a, in, in a very unpredictable time right now, so you may see, you know, my partner or my child or my pet or whatever it is, you know, make an appearance, but let's not let that interrupt, you know, our flow if that happens. And, and I think, you know, most people understand. So, so kind of just being transparent, uh, kind of putting it out there from the beginning. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think people do understand because we're all living in that moment right now. Do any of the other panelists have some comments on how we should prepare to present in this environment? You know, I think you can do all the right things. I think you can set the schedule, set some guidelines and some framework for everyone around us. But you know what? Don't be so hard on yourself. It's not going to be perfect 100% of the time. I don't have small kids. In fact, my daughter is graduated and off on her own. Um, but I do have my 85-year-old mom. And, you know, some people have kids in the background. Some people have dogs barking. My mom will just roll up and start talking, <laughs> right? And, and so, you know, companies, employers, colleagues um, need to understand that that's the time we're living in right now. And so don't be so hard on ourselves. Don't be so hard on each other. Um, we understand that these things are going to happen. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I think people are being very understanding, very understanding. So, um, you know, I just, I, I, I just say you, you kind of have to roll with, with the punches um, and uh, roll with what that day brings because it's not always going to be perfect. So cut ourselves a little bit of slack. If I, Lauren. Add, oh, I just want to add one thing on Deanne's point, Kenneth, that, um, you know, if an employer, potential employer has a problem with that, it says more about them than it does about you. That's and so right. if you evaluate that opportunity just as, as they are evaluating you, I would definitely let that be an input in your decision if you are offered the job. Wow, that's a very, that's a very, very valid point. Uh, and I speak to that a lot. Uh, with some of my career coaching clients when they have concerns about the way they're showing up. And it has to be the right fit, right, on both sides. Uh, find value in what you're bringing to the table as well, and I think that's to your point. Uh, sometimes it's just not the right situation if that is the challenge that you're experiencing. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's an important piece. Uh, Lauren, so listen, we know you're really busy. So what are you doing to kind of manage this Zoom environment and, and kind of showing up you know, in work situations on Zoom? Um, I think for me, one of the things that has worked well is keeping a schedule like a work schedule. Um, you know, I think we all were just thrown out of kind of like thrown out of whack when all this happened. But, you know, now we've been in it for a while. And that routine is really important, like getting up. I, it, it's like the simple things, but it has to be stated because not everyone is doing it, right? So like for me, what works is like getting up, showering, like getting dressed, like knowing that you're going to work every day and you are, even though you're just working from home. And so that re might require a number of Zoom calls. So you need to look presentable, like from the waist up. But one of the things I find to be very interesting and very challenging, and one, one of the things that you learn as we're all working from home is uh, listening and processing information is really key right now. And I understand that we all work so differently, um, but it couldn't be more important to listen. And the problem is we're so distracted. Like you know, what Felicia said, you might have your husband or your child pop in and you might be a little distracted 
or you might be focused, but things are happening beyond your control. And I think that's the one thing I noticed a little bit um, in meetings is not everyone is like fully receiving or understanding or processing 100% of the information. So if you know that could be the case, like make sure you're in a position to ask questions that allow you to get the information you need to do better at the role that you're doing. Because you might be on a conference call and you truthfully might only hear 60%. And the third, you know, and the 40% that you missed could have been the important part. So are we following up? Are we having regular conversations with our managers? Are we connecting with our teammates so that you're not working in isolation so that you kind of get the information that you may not have missed, whether it was on purpose or accidental, so that you're up to speed? Because that's really what your managers want you to know. Like they want to feel that you're working, even though we're all working from home, but that you're not running off to the grocery store and like running off doing errands while you should be working because you're not really getting work done if you're doing that. Wow. So, so we're speaking about people that are currently working and, you know, those people are in, you know, actually uh, favorable situations to many. Uh, there are some people that have not worked since March. It's been about six months since, since they've got up and went to their job. What, what can we share with those individuals that are looking to kind of get back into a regular work routine or just really looking for opportunities here in the workspace, in the, in the workplace right now. Um, all panelists, I'd like everyone to chime in, but uh, uh, Valicia, let's start with you real quick. What do you say to people that have been out for six months? First thing I'd say is don't lose the confidence, right? You are qualified, you are prepared, you are able, you have value. And so what we're seeing with you know the unemployment rate has no reflection on your value. And so I would start there on the confidence. The second is to really think about what this moment is teaching you, right? And I really believe that we all have a lesson in this moment. And for me, certainly, um, you know, the lesson has been, how do I innovate? You know, how do I think differently about my approach? How do I work more effectively? And figure out for you, you know, what is this moment? And it's hard to do that, especially when you are unemployed and looking for a job. And I know that. But I really do encourage you to take a moment to really think about what you need to learn in this moment. And it could be the use of technology. It could be going after, to Deanne's point, the job that maybe felt a bit out of reach and out of touch. But whatever that thing is, I would spend a little time, if you can, sorting that out. And then the last step is apply for the job and do what you have to do, right? Even if it means, you know, taking a job that you may not want to take at this time, if that's what it requires for you to pay your bills and to survive and take advantage of the resources that are out there and available, right? They are available. And so, you know, look at all of those options, do what you need to do. We've all had those moments where, you know, you just have to pay the bills and keep the lights on and there is no shame in that. So do what you need to do, but don't lose sight of the bigger picture once we get out of this. You know, speaking of the bigger picture, I know you were speaking about kind of maybe focusing in a little and I want to focus in on something with you here. So we have some 2020 graduates that are participating and watching this career fair. What's your advice to them? Uh, it's just, it's a real different situation. No one really kind of knows what to share with them. What would you share to our 2020 graduates that are out here? Oh, see, you made me smile even larger. Um, to, to our 2020 graduates who are watching, um, what a time to be graduating in your career and don't let it define you, right? It really is a moment, I believe, for you to go after everything that your heart desires. And so many of us, when we graduated from college, just followed the status quo, did the things that were expected of us and just followed the process that was laid out. And you have an oppor opportunity right now to disrupt the status quo and really do what your heart desires, right? And so take advantage of this moment and no one may understand your dreams. No one may understand, you know, your heart's desire, but it was placed on your heart for a reason. And so, you know, look at what it is that makes your heart sing. Um, but then the second thing is social media. I mean, we didn't have all of the tools and access that you all have now. Like if you wanted to reach out to Lauren or Deanne or to Kenneth and, or me right now, you could do it on social media. And so take advantage of the access 
that you have and also the tools you have to not only connect with other people to but to also build your own thing if that is you know what is in your heart yes yeah, so many tools. i wanted oh go ahead no, no so many tools for individuals to kind of connect now this is a really great time uh deanne let's go what were you what were you going to say you know, I was going to share with everyone that I have a 2020 graduate. And so my daughter just graduated from the School of Ed at American University. And what I've told her um, is that 2020 graduates, whether it's high school or it's college or beyond, this is the most resourceful, um, agile, and I believe one of the smartest graduating cohorts that any generation has seen. They have had to process a great deal of disappointment. Imagine that rite of passage at the end of four years and you don't get to walk across that stage and get your, your diploma handed to you. Um, a lot was lost and I watched my daughter mourn the loss of that. However, um, in going through that process, she showed up resourceful, finding and networking and really navigating a tough situation to really do what she wants to do. Um, and, and so, you know, your priorities shift. Uh, is it, do I want to come out and make money or do I really want to come out and do what I enjoy and what I'm passionate about? And, and it, it, it gives them the downtime to really figure that out. And so, yeah, I think, trust me, watch out world. You're going to look back at this cohort and you're going to say, whoa, these, these, these kids have come out and uh, they're, they're going to change some things for us. Lauren, I'm coming to you in a sec, but Deanne, I want to ask you something about that because you brought up like needing to make a decision as a graduate, like what do I want to do? Am I chasing money or am I chasing impact for something that's personal? Do you recommend, what do you think about volunteering during this time? Absolutely. Like, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Go volunteer. Go find a cause that you can that you can support, that you can stand for, that you can get behind and volunteer. You've got downtime on your hands. Go do it. And and then stay hopeful, right? Um it's difficult. I I get it. And for some of our, you know, some of our Gen Zs, it's very very difficult to deal with the disappointment, but staying hopeful and positive and finding the little things that bring you joy and spending some time on that. Um, we may never, as, 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 as bad as this sound, we may never have this type of downtime again to spend with our families, um, to, to figure out priorities, um, and to really, you know, align ourselves or realign ourselves to, to what's important in our lives. And that differs for everyone. But we may never see downtime like this again um, and, and take it for what it's worth. There's, there's some good in it, there's some bad in it, but we can stay hopeful. It's you know, not gonna be here forever. It's not gonna be here forever. And speaking about staying hopeful and kind of taking advantage of downtime, Lauren, I wanna speak to you about this downtime, right? So yeah. historic, historically, when we've had downturns in the economy, some great companies, some just revolutionary companies have came from that time. Do you think this is the time for 2020 graduates to consider entrepreneurship seriously? Yes, if they, if they have an idea, absolutely. I mean, I don't go into entrepreneurship for the sake of going to entrepreneurship. But I think if you have a problem that you want to solve, absolutely. Um, I think this class is so resilient. And to add to Deanne's point, I would say don't necessarily chase money because money will come. I would say chase skills chase skills and the opportunity to learn because that's what makes you val valuable and that's really what makes you worth you know getting paid a high salary in the future so really chase the opportunity to learn i mean this class is so resilient and that's something that we'll certainly see as this class is just like fighters who can come back um this cohort of people who are going through what they're going through but don't give up hope because people are looking for you you know people are looking for 2020 graduates they're looking to hire they're looking to round out their teams and don't get bogged down by the messages of where we are we know we're in scary times we know there's mass unemployment we understand that but we also understand that there's great growth opportunities people are hiring people are rounding out their teams they might just decide look 
we don't want to round it out with this senior level of folks. They're too much. We might want to bring in more mid-level and junior level people and go in this direction and go in a position where we can teach where, you know, you know, that's better for our business model right now. But I think that there are people who are looking for 2020 graduates understand that, you know, you will be online. You don't necessarily have to move to the city where you once were going to work out of that place. And then also look for, I just see a number of like fellowship programs, inter internship programs that are looking for people who've graduated, especially in our business and in our industry. They're looking to hire people who just graduated, pay them, you know, internship dollars for six months to a year with the intent to hire full time. And if you are living at home, you can actually hopefully afford that arrangement. And um, it really allows you to be in a position to learn because that's really what you need to be in right now is, is learn. It's not about the salary. It's about, it's really about the skills because you could take those skills and use them to start your own business or use them on a side project or something like that if the time presents itself. You know, I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying and I love it. Uh, it's kind of like about betting on yourself and your skills, right? So I want to bring, I want to bring Valicia in here because not only do you need to bet on yourself, but you also need to invest in yourself. So what are your thoughts about increasing your knowledge base? People going back to school, maybe taking some online courses. I, I had the opportunity to look at your profile, saw your past work with a company that does a lot of things that really lead people to invest in themselves. And I just want to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, a great time right now to, you know, pick up new skills and new tools and to sharpen the ones that we currently have. And, and that goes for every age group, you know, regardless of level and position or role or wherever you are. You know, I think that we always have to think about how to reinvent ourselves. Um, I, I always have this analogy, you know, that it's kind of like musical chairs. You never want to be left without a seat when the music stops. And the music always stopped, right? I think, you know, it is imperative that we stay fresh, stay current. And, and a part of that is definitely, you know, getting more education if that's where, you know, you feel like you want to be. Uh, but then also just like hands-on skills too. You know, I think of every job opportunity that I ever had that was a breakthrough moment, um, you know, a new industry, a new role, new skill. Um, I, I started as an intern or a volunteer, even while working for someone else. So, you know, don't be afraid um, to bet on yourself, invest in yourself. Um, and sometimes that means collecting new experiences um, to kind of whet your appetite and to see, you know, maybe what you want to do next. And so I think that's a part of, you know, living a purpose-driven life, right? Finding out, you know, what it is that you want to do next and then going for it. Man, this, this has been absolutely amazing. I could go on all day with this conversation. I'd like to thank all the members of our panel on behalf of the National Urban League, but I'd also like to have you guys answer uh, one last question. Uh, and, and, and we'll start, you know what, let's start with uh, you, Lauren. Uh, what is your best advice during this pandemic, during this upheaval, political and social unrest, just all over the place? What's your advice for job seekers during this period? On the professional front, learn as much as possible. So um, really try to map out a plan for yourself. I understand the climate that we're in. We could feel deflated, we can feel defeated and all these emotions come our way, but you don't let that distract you from where you wanna be. Um, map out a plan for yourself, have a strategic goal. Where do you wanna be from a year from now? The, take aside all of this and say, where would you like to be a year from now? And who can your life like connect you to those places and, and connect the dots along the way? And then I would say research, learn, like pick up a new skill set, maybe take an online course, maybe take a certificate class if you can, if you have the means to support that, but keep your skills fresh, always be able to come to the table with more. And then on a personal level, really carve out that time to uh, have alone time to really reflect um, and to get connected spiritually if you can, because there's a lot being thrown at us, especially black men and women, and it could be emotionally draining and you can really just feel sad at times. So I think that there's just moments where you just need to disconnect, be by yourself and like reconnect spiritually. Thank you. Deanne, would you like to come in? Yeah, I do want to comment, and I, I agree with everything that Lauren said. I, I thought maybe I could comment from the lens of an employer, a leader, a hiring manager, because 
um, we will have, uh, you know, those those uh, roles represented at, at the career fair. And so I, I would say to our employers, our hiring managers, and our leaders, we're all going through this change, and we process information and digest it differently. Um, and we should be aware of that. Not everyone's starting from the same point. No one, you, you know, we, we don't all understand um, or are as educated on racism in America or the political climate. Um, leaders have to be self-aware and they have to be sensitive and they need to be compassionate. But most of all, most of all I would say they need to be empathetic. And so um, we as leaders and as hiring managers, we need to create opportunities where um, where, where uh, you know, prospective um, uh, employees and candidates um, feel psychologically safe to, to speak out. Um, we need to give those opportunities to our employees who are with us today uh, so that they can talk about the experiences. And, and from there, we build on trust and we build it through transparency. So um, my, my last words are, um, to, to our employers, uh, we've, we've, we've got to think differently and we've got to create some safety around um, the stresses that, that people are going through today. And, and we can only do that by, by leading with empathy. Ms. Butterfield Jones. I'll, I'll close by just saying, you know, you only have one life. We all do. And so just live it fully. You know, we all gave, you know, the best advice that we had to give today, but it's still, you know, your life to live. And so as you decide and chart your course, you know, follow your instincts. And I think so often, you know, as we are, you know, in college and as we go into our careers and, and roles, you know, we sometimes, you know, talk ourselves out of things. Uh, but our instincts normally uh, can lead the way and have those breakthrough moments. And so if you feel, you know, compelled, strongly compelled, to move in a direction, don't talk yourself out of it. I really believe that that may be God's voice calling you into something higher and in, into maybe even a different direction. So, you know, stay strategic, follow your instincts, keep the faith and just keep going. We're gonna come out of this better. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Again, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank all of you uh, on behalf of the National Urban League. And I'd also like to thank the uh, National Urban League team for putting together a great, event today. Um, thank you for joining us for the Virtual Diversity Career Fair. This is part of the Urban League Fights for You virtual series. My name is Kenneth L. Johnson. Here's to a better 2021. I hope we made a difference today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.